Good morning, church. Good to see you guys, and uh, good morning to those. I know we have uh, many families like ours that are dealing with some illnesses and people on the road, so to our CBC family abroad, uh, on the road, or even at home, uh, good morning to you guys as well. Um, just thinking about this passage and thinking about the fact that one of the most uh, uh, fascinating things to me about us, about human beings, that is, and the way that God has made us and wired us is all our innate desire for a home. And think about how much that idea, that theme of home, uh, pervades our lives, our culture in countless ways. Think about that desire for a, a place where we belong, a refuge where we're safe, a stable place to live and to love, to experience life. Think about the way this pops up in our music, for example. Several artists through the years, to name a few, like Chris Daughtry, Michael Buble, Cheryl Crow, and the Foo Fighters. Those are some different genres there for you, (laughs) if you're paying attention. They all have songs simply titled Home, where they're singing about this. It almost seems to be a rite of passage to be a true rock star. You have to write a song about home while you're on the road, right? Uh, You're out there and you're missing home, so you're singing about it. You think about John Denver famously singing of those country roads that would take him home to West Virginia, or Leonard Skinner singing of Sweet Home, Alabama, where the skies are so blue, Sweet Home, Alabama, Lord, I'm coming home to you. I don't know what he was talking about, Um, a little biased as a Louisiana kid. (laughs) The theme of home shows up in our books and movies, though. Think about The Wizard of Oz, where Dorothy says that famous line, there's no place like home. Or E.T., where the cute but creepy alien says, E.T., phone home, right? He just wants to go back home to his family. Think about Tolkien's book, The Hobbit, where Bilbo Baggins leaves the safety of his home in the Shire to help a group of dwarves reclaim their homeland that they lost. If you want to go down another level, it pops up in our kids' films. Think about Simba returning to his homeland from exile. Woody and Buzz fighting their way back to Andy. Or Marlin and Dory working to find Nemo after he's swept away from his home. The point is there's something in these stories, in these songs, that connects with us. We're moved by these things, this desire for home. It even makes it in the games that we play. If kids are outside, or adults, you guys can play this too, playing tag or hide and seek, there's often a home base where you're safe from that evil person who is it and trying to get you. I was chuckling this week because it showed up when I was coaching baseball. I actually came up, I changed the sermon title uh, while I was both reflecting on this passage and planning a baseball practice because the whole objective of baseball is to get your players around the bases and safely to the final base, which is shaped like a house (laughs) and called home plate. And the other team is trying to prevent you from making it home. It's just the point, it's a theme that runs all through our lives, all through our culture, all over the place. And more importantly, the story of Scripture, the Christian life, is really a journey about making it home. When the story of Scripture begins in the Garden of Eden, we see the home that we were made for, a place where we could dwell in God's presence as His people, worshiping Him, satisfied in Him. And the tragedy of sin is that we lost fellowship with God. That was broken And we were exiled from that home, lost it with him. Paradise, the presence of God, of God among us are gone, just like that. But by God's grace, the gospel story is about God pursuing us, saving rebels like us, adopting us as his children through the work of his son, also that he can bring us home to him as his children. And we see that purpose begin to unfold in Genesis when God called Abraham made a covenant with him, and promised to bring him into this new land where all nations would be, they'd be blessed through him. He's going to have a place to dwell with God, be with him. God as the God of his people, his people enjoying him as their God. And part of those promises to Abraham were that God's people would be slaves one day in a foreign land for hundreds of years, but they would be saved and delivered, brought to the land of promise. And where we left off two weeks ago in Exodus, God had just fulfilled that word. In Exodus 12, the people leave Egypt and they set out, set out on this journey to a homeland. 
And in chapter 13, we see three essential things that Israel must remember on the road if they're going to make it home. And as we consider what God is doing with Israel in these verses, we too should be reminded of the bigger picture of what's happening here. And that is the story of our own salvation and the journey of all God's people to an even better home in the new creation. And along the way, we too must remember these three things that we see in the passage. What God has already done to save us, what God is presently doing to bring us home, and then what God has promised he will do in the future. And so let's work through each of those together in this passage. The first one being, we must remember what God has done in the past. So several aspects of God's work of salvation are highlighted for the people in the first 16 verses. So the first thing that we can point out is we need to remember who we were saved by. God makes this clear to the Israelites through a repeated line of the passage. We heard it when Martin was reading it to us. It pops up four times. Verse 3, then Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand, Yahweh brought you out from this place. Then verse 9, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of Yahweh may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, Yahweh has brought you out of Egypt. Then in verse 14, and when in time to come, your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand, Yahweh brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. And again in verse 16, it shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand, Yahweh brought us out of Egypt. God doesn't really leave room for doubt here. This is the message that we need to receive, that we need to reflect on. What must they remember? By a strong hand, Yahweh has saved you, delivered you out of Egypt. And recognize that here that it's not just that God was victorious. It's how it happened that's equally important. It's not like the ten plagues were ten rounds in a boxing match, right? Where uh, Yahweh and Pharaoh were going at it. Each one took their blows, but God gets the final punch and emerges victorious. No, beginning to end, that's the point, with a strong hand, a victorious hand, God has brought them out. God has routed Egypt. Egypt's king and their deities are defeated and dethroned before the people's eyes. The land is undone. The people's hearts are so in the hands of God that when we left off, they had given the Israelites their gold and jewelry. They give them their possessions as they leave. We need to also remember who we were saved by and how he accomplished the salvation. We celebrated it last week, and we celebrate it every Sunday that we gather, is that Jesus did not luck out of an evenly matched battle, right? He didn't limp out of the grave weakly, getting the win, but needing an off-season to rest because he's so exhausted and weary. No, when he rises from the grave, he rises victoriously, triumphing over the grave, over sin, over Satan. The message of Scripture is death cannot hold him. The gates of Hades cannot stand against his people, stop his church. And so we need to remember the magnitude of Christ's victory as his people. Remember what he has accomplished. Because of him, we are, as Paul writes in Romans 8, more than conquerors in him. Next, we need to remember what we were saved from. So in chapter 13, God gives the Israelites an additional memorial to observe into the future, and that's the consecration of the firstborn. It's commanded in verses 1 through 2, and then it's explained in verses 11 through 16. So to consecrate the firstborn was to set them apart to God as holy to God. It's to acknowledge that everything belongs to them and especially they belong to him. So Yahweh says in verse 2, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. What this meant, explained in verses 11 and following, was that every firstborn male of their livestock was to be given over as a sacrifice to Yahweh. But then there are two special creatures mentioned, donkeys and people. Isn't it humbling that we get lumped together with the donkeys (laughs) in this passage? But donkeys seem to represent unclean animals that they wouldn't eat. So if they're to keep the donkey, they either must redeem it or the donkey must die. But what's clear in both cases 
is that no firstborn is to live without a redeeming sacrifice, right? The payment of a ransom is necessary. So the connection to the events that preceded the ceremony is pretty obvious. Whose lives were in danger when the 10th plague happened? It's the lives of the firstborn, right? The firstborn of the people and of the livestock. They were only spared through the blood of the sacrificial lamb. So this instruction would be a constant reminder among the people of how they were saved by God and the fact that they belong to God. Yahweh already declared Israel to be his firstborn son in Exodus. And this son was redeemed and delivered through the blood of the lamb. And so this reminder sets the stage, obviously, for the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. For any of our lives to be saved, to be restored, they must be redeemed through substitution. That's what this ceremony is pointing towards. Jesus is this Passover sacrificial lamb. As we read a couple weeks ago, Paul's own words in 1 Corinthians 6, that we were bought with a price. We were redeemed through the price of Jesus' blood. And so we remember what we were saved from, the judgment of God. And third, we need to remember what we were saved unto. We won't say as much here about the Feast of Unleavened Bread in verses 3 through 10 because we spent a a decent amount of time on it uh, when we were in Exodus last. But remember when we did cover it that this is a feast that's both about haste and about holiness. So they were to eat unleavened bread not only because it would take less time, but because it symbolized the removal of leaven from their lives, the removal of sin from their lives. We've said several times in this series that the people not only needed to be delivered out of Egypt, right, but Egypt needed to be delivered really out of the people. They needed Egypt taken out of them. And in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul likens the Christian life as really living during this feast of unleavened bread, a time where we remove sin, where we remove corruption from our hearts and from our homes and from our church. We put sin to death and remove it from the camp so that we can be set apart to God, to be holy as He is holy. And so we must remember that we've been saved by Jesus. Remember that we've been saved from God's judgment and the penalty of death, and that we've been saved unto holiness and service to God. Even more than that, the people are told how they are to remember these things. Verse 9 It says, it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of Yahweh may be in your mouth. And then likewise in verse 16, it shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes for by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So the words and memorials are to be before their eyes, on their minds, in their mouths at all times. This would lead later generations to like do that physically, to have those reminders on them so that they could remember the word of the Lord and the work of the Lord. I was trying to think of a modern equivalent, and it seemed pretty easy. These things are to be as present as the smartwatches on your wrists and the phones that you will probably check more often than we care to admit during the day. Something that's always before your eyes. That's what this was to be for the people. This work of God was to be before them at all times, meditating on his word, meditating on his work. And on our journey home, we need these continual, visual, practical reminders of what God has done in Christ to save us. We are just too prone to wander, too prone to forget. And so how do we cultivate this kind of remembrance? We could start with some of the ways that God prescribes for us in His Word for us to remember. We do this personally by Psalm 1, meditating on his law day and night, meditating on his word, devoting the scriptures to our minds and hearts. We do this by simply communing with God in prayer, in worship, meeting with our Father. We do this as a church in a host of ways that Christ has prescribed and the New Testament's prescribed. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, for example, we're preaching that message to ourselves of Christ's substitutionary death, of his perfect righteousness in our place, of all the promises of the new covenant that he has secured through his blood. When we celebrate baptism, we are proclaiming that a person has gone from death to life in Christ, 
that they've been buried with Christ and raised to new life in Him by faith in Him. And we're reminded in those moments that God has done the same for all of us as we celebrate that, for all who are in Christ. When we gather on Sundays like this, we're reminded of the gospel that saves us. We're gathering every week on a Sunday, on the day that Jesus rose from the grave. We hear the word proclaimed. We sing the truth of the gospel together. We go out from here to encourage and exhort one another with these words. In addition to these things, you could also just say, God has placed reminders of his work all around us in creation. There's a reason that John Calvin called creation the theater of God's glory. Scripture uses creation metaphors and illustrations all the time so that if we're just paying attention, when we look in the mirror, when we look at the blue sky or the starry night or the sandy shore, hopefully soon, or the birds of the air and the flowers blooming in spring, that we have ample reason to be reminded of God's faithfulness, of His power, of His providence, of His work for his people. And so we're disciplined to remember what he has done. And then second, we must also remember what he is doing in the present. In verses 17 through 22, we see both God's continued provision for his people and his presence among his people. So start with that first idea, God's providence. He doesn't just deliver Israel from slavery, kind of put them out into the middle of nowhere and say, good luck, (laughs) you know, hope you guys make it, make it home. He doesn't just leave them to themselves. He leads them according to his perfect wisdom. And he gives them exactly what they need on the road home. So pick up in verse 17 and pay attention as we're reading this again to where God doesn't lead them and why he doesn't take them there. It says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war, And return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. This is really interesting to me. It makes sense that God doesn't take them near the Philistines, right? He recognizes that his people had never seen war, and once they experience what it's like, they they're they're gonna tuck tail and head back to Egypt. And it's not like uh, an unwarranted concern there because they do this exact thing in Numbers 14. (laughs) When you get there later, they're ready to go back to, to Egypt. But pay attention to where God does lead them. The wilderness towards the Red Sea, which will actually enclose them and bait Pharaoh into attacking them when they're cornered. (laughs) It's a strange twist in the story, right? In the movies, I feel like when someone isn't prepared for a battle or a fight, That's when the epic music clicks on and the training montage begins. It's time to get this person battle ready. So you watch like the Rocky movies, think about him getting ready to fight Apollo Creed or or Drago in in Rocky IV. He goes through these epic training montages. Or maybe you think about like Karate Kid hanging out with Mr. Miyagi or even, you know, Luke Skywalker visiting Yoda. All right, they're getting ready for what's to come. But God's solution for his people when they're not ready to see war, (laughs) is to take them from a situation where fear is going to lead them to run away to a situation where they will have nowhere to run at all. (laughs) Their only option is going to be to trust God to save them where he's leading them. We watched, uh, because Jonah finished the first, um, first part, the Fellowship of the Ring, Lord of the Rings book, and so we watched the movie with him this week, and I was thinking about this scene when they enter the mines of Moria in the mountains. And it's a pretty dangerous road ahead of them. And I think several of them want to turn back and then the door collapses behind them. And it's like, well, <laughs> there goes that option. We're obviously going forward through the mountain at this point. And the only way is forward. Or I think about, for me, skydiving. Uh, if you, get, you guys ever see like me talk about going skydiving or say that I have a desire to do it, something is wrong with me, Okay. I, I, I do not want to do this at all. And I believe if I was up in the plane and looked out, regardless of how much money had been invested in this, I'd be like, no, I'm good. I'm not jumping out of this plane. Like, I'll see you guys back on land when the, when the plane lands. But the situation's different if the plane is on fire and about to crash land, right? At that, 
at that moment, you're like, all right, this is the only option. We're, we're going to need to jump out with the parachute. And it seems that God is pretty good at doing this with his people. He puts us in situations where we have nowhere to run. We have nowhere to turn, no one else to turn to. No other option but to jump forward and trust him in that moment. That's what God's people need in this situation. And when we jump, when we trust, it's there that God meets us with his grace, with his all-sufficient presence. And we're going to see that in the Israelite story going forward. And so that's the second aspect here, is that God is present with his people to guide them and care for them. So look in verses 21 through 22. It says, And Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Such a powerful display here of God leading his people. And it returns, returns to that theme of, of fire as a symbol of God's presence. Remember in Genesis 15, when God made a covenant with Abraham, he passed between the animal pieces, appearing in the form of a flaming torch and a fire pot. And then in Exodus 3, God appeared to Moses in a burning bush. In Exodus 19, God's going to appear at Mount Sinai. It's going to be wrapped in smoke as he descends on it in fire. And then the book of Exodus is going to end with God's glory filling the tabernacle in this form, the form of cloud and fire. The point here is that God is going to be with them and go before them every step of the way. He's not going to leave his people. They're able to travel day and night as God provides all the light that they need. His presence, verse 22, didn't depart from the people. And so all they needed to do was follow him, trust in his presence, and they'll be safe. They'll be secure. So can you just, I mean, let's just pause here and imagine the sight. Imagine being among the Israelites as you follow the Lord in this way. As we picture it, we might be a bit envious of the Israelites, of their experience. Maybe you wish God would show up in your life in a, in a very similar way, a pillar of cloud and fire to guide you to the right place, to all the right life decisions. Wouldn't that be nice? You can't miss God's will for you then, right? It's just like lit up right there before you. One of the games our kids play on the Nintendo is a Lego game, which honestly um, doesn't take a great deal, deal of skill to master. Um, there's a transparent Lego guy in the game that goes before you on every level and leaves transparent blue pieces in a trail that you just follow to where you're supposed to go in the game. If there's a door you need to enter, there's usually a large blue arrow pointing to the door, like, enter this one. And then if you're walking by something and you should interact with it, it like glows and pulses at you. It's like, oh, you know, what do I need to do here? Maybe, maybe I should take this radiating block from the person waving at me with an arrow over their head. <laughs> it's like, it seems like a clear enough sign of what to do to progress. And maybe you wish God sometimes would make it that obvious for you, a pillar of cloud and fire to lead you to the right person to marry, to the right school to go to, to the right job, to the right neighborhood or house, to the right decisions for your future or the right decisions for your kid's future. You pray, Lord, show me the person that you want me to share the gospel with, and a fire trail leads you to a person wearing a shirt that says, tell me about Jesus. <laughs> like, Praise God for that clarity, right? That would be amazing. But we want to realize, Christians, that we have something even better than that. God doesn't just go before us to blaze a trail. The Bible tells us the Holy Spirit actually has taken up residence in you. That God is dwelling in his people. He is with you. And as Paul says in Philippians, he is working in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. He is our ever-present God who leads us into all truth, who eliminates our minds and hearts to understand what he has inspired in the scriptures. He's the one who grants us new eyes and affections for Jesus, empowers our obedience, intercedes for us, and gives us exactly what we need most. Not what we want most, right? Right? Not necessarily the path that we would choose for ourselves. 
He does all this so that we will be made like Jesus and that we will make it home to him. And so remember what he's doing. Remember his presence and trust in him. And that leads us to the third tool on the way home, the third thing we must remember, and that's what God will do in the future. So two weeks ago, we witnessed Israel walk out of Egypt with great possessions and silver and gold, but that's not all they took along for the ride. Look in verse 19 of chapter 13. We're told that Moses also took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. It's a quotation of Joseph's earlier words in Genesis 50, verses 24 through 25, where he expressed his faith that God was going to keep his promises to his people, that they weren't going to be in Egypt forever. And he makes them promise that when that day comes, they're going to take his bones out of Egypt and bring them with him to the promised land. And those are remarkable words of faith from Joseph. And that's how the author of Hebrews interprets them for us. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, the author gives us a definition of faith. Saying, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. What faith means then is trusting in God so fully that you believe he's going to accomplish all that he's promised. He's going to do all that he said he would do. And then down in verse 22, Joseph is commended for this type of faith. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Yet that even though Joseph wasn't going to see it personally, even though the people were going to be slaves in Egypt for centuries, he had no doubt that God was one day going to act on his word in his timing, and he was going to save his people and deliver them. And so, out of faith, Joseph arranged essentially his funeral and his will to be an expression of that faith. Prepare my bones for transport. We won't be in Egypt forever because God is faithful. He's going to keep his promises. And what a visible reminder for the people as they're on the road, (laughs) that these bones are essentially preaching to them a message of God's faithfulness to his word, of his promise to bring them to a better place. And Joseph's faith is a model for all of us who trust in Jesus and look to his return and the new creation that God has promised to bring us to. Because every one of us who dies before that day must lay our own bones outside of that final destination to rest. We die in faith that God has promised a future resurrection, secured through the resurrection of Jesus, and that that, when that day comes, we will live in a new city, a new creation, a new land with our God as we dwell in resurrected, perfected bodies. And so going back to Hebrews 11, to verses 13 through 16, The author tells us that all of these spiritual ancestors of ours are examples of of people who set their eyes and their hope on these promises and live their lives accordingly. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland." If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. That's what it means to live by faith, brothers and sisters. We walk on earth as strangers and exiles here. We are seeking a better city, a better world, a better home than this broken one. It's part of the fuel that gets us home is that we keep our eyes on Christ and on that heavenly city, which we read of in Revelation 21 through 22. would encourage you to make it a regular practice to read those chapters, to meditate on them, to reflect on the promises of what's to come. There we read of a city of indescribable beauty and perfection, a city of incorruptible holiness, 
righteousness, a land of eternal life and joy, a city of unending light because the glory of God is there lighting it up. It's a home where God makes us dwelling with his people permanently, our Father dwelling with his blood-bought children forever and ever and ever. And so as we keep our eyes on those things, as we continue to remember those things, here are a few questions to ask us in light of this word today. The first being, are you today trusting in Christ and what he has done to save you? Praise God that being a Christian, following Jesus is not a matter of what do we need to do, but what God has already done in Christ, what he has accomplished to save us, not what we can do to save ourselves. And the message of Exodus in the entire Bible is clear. Someone has to die for our sin. A substitute has to be offered in our place or we pay the penalty of death. But there is no life without an atoning sacrifice, a redeeming work. And the gospel is that God sent his precious, perfect son to pay that price of redemption so that we, sinners though we were, could become cleansed, saved, blood-bought, and daughters of God. Again, not by works of ours, but solely through the merit of Jesus Christ. Everything we just discussed about the new creation, about the resurrection, is available in Jesus and only in Jesus. So the question for you today, friend, is do you trust him? Do you trust in what he has done to save you? And Christian, if you have, are you living daily in that shadow of the cross? Does what the, the work that Christ has already done shape the way that you see the world and see others and see yourself? Are you disciplining yourself to remember what Christ has accomplished in the ways that we outlined earlier? Reading the word regularly, communing with God, gathering with the church body faithfully, and on and on. All these ways that we bring these things to remembrance every day, every week. We need them that often. So that's first. Are you trusting in Christ? Second, are you trusting the Spirit to empower and guide you according to His wisdom? That's an important (laughs) caveat there, right? That last part's key. It's easy to trust the Spirit's guidance when He leads us in ways that match our expectations and takes us places that we hoped we'd go all along the way, (laughs) right? Here are my plans. Spirit leads us there. Great. We're in agreement. It's good to see that, that God is leading us exactly where we wanted to be. It's much tougher when he leads us to a place that leaves us feeling hopeless, helpless, confused, or exposed. And so let this be a fresh reminder today that God alone knows what's best for you. He knows what he's doing. And so ask him in prayer today for greater faith to trust what he's doing in your life, even when it's not clear, to trust that he knows what he's doing. And then third and finally, are you longing today to be home with your God? Or is your greatest desire just to be with him? You think about Paul in Philippians 1 when he's having like this internal battle, to having to decide which one he'd rather, to stay and work and continue to labor for the gospel or just to be with Christ. And Paul's pretty real with us, right? Be honest, it's up to me to depart and be with Christ. It's far better. That's where I want to be. The only reason he says that I'm going to stay is to work on your behalf for your joy, right? But if I had it my way, man, I just want to be with Jesus. I want to be home with my God. Is that your desire today? Is that your, your heart's yearning? You groan and strive and long for the day of Christ's return, for the arrival of the new creation to be fully, finally delivered from your sin. Because if that's our greatest longing, the point is it's going to change the way that we live now, right? If that's where our home is, if that's where our future hope is, that's where we're going to invest our lives. And so the questions we could ask off that are, are there areas where you're investing exclusively in this world, rather than investing your life, your resources, your heart in Christ's kingdom? Are there areas in your life where you're essentially saying, my kingdom come, 
rather than pleading, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. And so, just ask you as we respond to this word, that you would pray to God today to help you, to help us loosen our grip on our love of this world and to fill us more and more with a love for him and a longing to be home with him. Would you pray with me as we do that? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your work to save us, what has already accomplished for us, that you have done everything through the sending of your son, his sacrifice on our behalf, his victory over the grave. Everything has been accomplished to save us from sin, to reconcile us to you, and to get us home. And so we praise you today for that work that's been accomplished. We thank you, God, that right now as we gather, as we hear these things, that you're at work among us, that the Spirit is helping us to understand more of of who Christ is, to give us new appetites and affections so that we will love you more than the things of this world, to lead us and guide us according to your wisdom for what's best so that we're conformed more and more to the image of Jesus made ready for our home with you. And Father, help us that as we are so prone to forget, prone to wander, not to lose sight of what is to come soon. What is to come when Christ returns, when your kingdom is fully established and we can enjoy eternity with you in this new heavens and new earth. And so Father, would you lead us now to respond appropriately to you, to your word. Would you guide us into truth? Would you lead us to repentance where it's needed? Comfort us where comfort is needed. And would you change us and make us more like your son? We ask this all in his name. Amen.